I must say thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you today. As I said, I am not a specialist in infrastructure specific fields, uh, but I work, I've worked in the in field of infrastructure development for the last 25 years. So uh, I'm going to have uh, just an overall view of infrastructure development. How do we look at it from a country side? And then secondly, what opportunities are there for the CSIR and in the built environment specifically? So we're going to look at public spend. We're going to look at the National Infrastructure Plan. And remember, the plan does not, it's not all the infrastructure spent. There's infrastructure spent outside the plan. Your built environment and your, your key uh, capability sets in here, and then some key considerations. If we go to the infrastructure spent, let's just have a look at the past infrastructure spent. Um, what we can see here, is if you look at this, that the shift of infrastructure spent, this is your national government departments in the past, this is your provincial departments and local government. So if we start to have a look at the pure government spending, it's going to take place in the future also mainly at local government, and we do know that we have some challenges around capacity there. Uh, it's increased significantly, as you could see, from uh, 2011. And what we also can see in the last three-year period, uh, the public spend on infrastructure development uh, has stopped one point, uh, over a trillion rand. And uh, it's mainly, 82% of that was really on your economic infrastructure. It's the highest in 25 years. If you look at the infrastructure spent over the last 40 years, and it is both in uh, nominal terms, we can see it's 60 times uh, in the last 40 years that it's increased. If you look at it in nominal terms, uh, real terms, you will see it's about doubled with about 2%. So if you want to see there, you can see that we have actually had quite a lot of, of infrastructure spent taking place there. If we go to the next three year in the medium term expenditure framework. You can see that we're looking at close to a billion rand, 800 uh, uh, a billion rand, close to a trillion rand. And if you start to look at it, 42% is in transport and logistics. So 20% uh, in energy and 14% in water and sanitation. If you look at the vehicles used for the rollout of this infrastructure, 45% sit in your state-owned companies, 22% on local government level, and 17% on your provincial level. The next highest category is then your 10%, and that's your public uh, enterprises. And just to say, public enterprises are those enterprises that get uh, funded by transfer funding, while your state-owned uh, state companies, the SOCs, actually do their own balance sheet-related lending. Uh, for infrastructure development. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit around the PICC because in 2011, government stood back and said, uh, if you look at both the National Development Plan as well as the Natural Growth Path, that infrastructure development is going to be the key jobs driver. And with that, we needed to stand back and look at what is going to make the difference because we had many lessons learned from the past. Through those processes, uh, the PICC, which was then operated as a cabinet committee, it's now a statutory body because it's got its own set of legislation, was established to coordinate, integrate, and accelerate implementation. As one of the items that was identified uh, in failure in infrastructure development in the past was that we work in silos, we redo the work in different silos, we do not have the right level of, of uh, alignment of programs around that. And then lastly, there's quite a lot of programs that get delayed. Another reason was to develop a single common national infrastructure plan that will be monitored on a central basis. Now, just to note on that, um, private sector, when the bill was put together and uh, approved to go into legislation. Private sector was very concerned that government now wants to monitor their infrastructure development. And it's not. It's how government organizes itself through both 
your public entities, your state-owned entities, and the three spheres of government. The th third uh, reason was also to identify who is responsible for, for the infrastructure development and hold them accountable. Because in many times in the past, when you had either cost or time overruns, it was always very difficult, it was mostly difficult to actually find the accountable people to take, take the, 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 the remedial action, but secondly, also take the accountability for that. Lastly was to develop a 20-year planning framework, um, and that was also done to be able to overcome what we've seen in the past, like with every five-year change of administration, we actually had people going back and the government at that stage then stood back and redid planning for the next period. They were focusing on the five-year delivery programs, not taking into account that most of your economic infrastructure goes further than a five-year time horizon. The cross-cutting work of the PICC, and I think there is also quite a lot of alignment with some of your research impact areas that I've seen in your business plan, but also some of the functionalities and capabilities that you have. Um, one of the items that uh, PICC needed to have a look at was state, state capacity, because there was recognition on a political level that we actually have a little bit of a broken state, if I can call it in that way, because we did not have the capacity to execute necessarily in your national, provincial, local government, and even in some of your state-owned entities. Uh, skills development, there is a big debate around the appropriate skills. Uh, we tried to do a 10-year, a 20-year type of plan to see what skills do we need for the next 20 years to be able to roll out infrastructure. I think some of the critical elements around that was also how do you look at attrition, in other words, people retiring, which is currently highly skilled and expertise in place, and how do you make sure that you build up the younger generation to be able to move into those specialist positions. Uh, infrastructure GIS mapping. Uh, it would be surprising if we tell you that GIS information in government has always been difficult to get. Uh, sometimes it's not updated, sometimes it's non-existing, sometimes you can use the same GIS information for more than one government department. Uh, industrialization, and I think this is where the CSIR actually can play a quite a big role because industrialization is definitely one of the focus areas for this government and into the next number of years in our plans. Funding and spending, uh, just to, to talk a little bit around that, uh, we always said money is a problem, there's not enough money. If you started to do an analysis, you would have picked up that sometimes it's the ability to spend more than the availability of money, specifically in your government departments, if it's through uh, national, provincial, and local government. Uh, innovative building technologies. Uh, the building technology space is an important site that we need to have a look at. And we, we always recognized that the conventional building mechanisms, methods, and materials that are used uh, can be improved, both from a time and cost factor, if we start to get general acceptance and develop the, building, the innovative building technology component. And maintenance, uh, I've seen in your corporate plan, you also have a big focus on maintenance and how you will help. I will tell a story. Uh, and I think you have dealt with it in some of the previous sessions. As if you look at it, um, the question was always, do we have an enabling framework to be able to focus on maintenance of assets in the country and in government and state structures? And if you go back to the work that was done even as far back as 2006, the enabling frameworks are there. It is the implementation of that that's problematic. Right, now we're quickly going to move to the 18 SIPs, and the reason why I'm doing that, because that is where the majority of the capital spend is going to take place, 
Some of you may be familiar with that. I've worked with some of the colleagues on, uh, when I was on the PICC technical task team. But I thought I will work through that because if you stand back and I looked at all the key areas of skills and uh, research priority areas in the, in the CSIR, there's a great overlap. The question is what do you do around that? The geographic SIPs is uh, SIP 1, which is then uh, unlocking the northern mining belt and the Waterberg as catalyst. And what you need to see there is we've got mineral resources, rail, water, energy generation. You actually look at the rail capacity side that needs to be improved to be able to get product to the market. And uh, the logistics side around Mpumalanga and Gauteng that needs to be developed. Sub two is the Durban Free State Gauteng uh, Logistics and um, Industrial Corridor. This contains mainly the development of uh, the container depots that needs to be built as well as improvement to road and rail infrastructure and specifically harbour infrastructure. If you go to SIP 3, which is then the southeastern node and corridor development, this is then looking at bringing your um, water into the Eastern Cape. We look at manganese rail capacity to PE, as well as the center plant, the smelter, is still far into planning into the future, and then the refinery is also for, for further into the future itself. SIP4 deals with a, uh, the economic opportunities in the, nor in the northern province, uh, so the northeast province. Uh, there we have quite a lot of investment, and this is mainly investment that is funded by government, both your road, rail, rail not a little, not that much, but the bulk water and the water treatment infrastructure. And um, I had the opportunity uh, recently to work in the Rustenburg area. I did some work for the Royal Buffalo Nation. And if you look at the development of, of backyard dwellers, because that's really how some of the community there makes money, but on the other hand, the pressure that it puts on infrastructure is problematic. There's the second part around it is how do we deal with the housing development? Because this is one of the areas, although platinum is not earning as much money as it used to be, but this is one of the areas that they need to really have a look at and see how we can do things differently, specifically from a housing development too. Saldana uh, uh, Session uh, Corridor, and this is then also improving the, uh, the c capability for your iron ore uh, uh, infrastructure to export more, as well as then having it as a hub for oil and gas uh, capability. And I do think you were involved in the ocean, unlocking the ocean Pakisa uh, 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 processes that was run earlier on. If you look at SIP 8, this is all the energy, energy related side, which is both from your renewable energy side to your additional uh, electricity generation. So nuclear will fill in here falling here, and I was wondering how many nuclear scientists we have in the CSIR. And then also then your electricity uh, density, uh, uh, electricity rollout of your transmission lines and distribution and looking at backlog of rollout of energy. Sub 6 is your spatial ship that, de a ship that deals with your 23 least resourced uh, municipalities, and there once again it is water, electricity, and sanitation infrastructure and roads. If you look at sub-7, this is very much the previous session that we had this morning, dealing with how do you develop integrated urban space. We also have a look at how do you change the, uh, the uh, integrated transport systems in the country. So seven cities is rolling out currently integrated bus uh, transport system. Uh, it's just concerning if you read in the papers, if you start to look at what's happened to the 2010 buses that was bought that was never put to use into many cities, uh, specifically PE at the moment. Then we have agri-logistics and rural infrastructure. And what we need to see is, is how do you create economic activity in your rural areas and how do you create an opportunity 
in infrastructure development that can help people to get product to the market. Also, so it's storage and marketing component together with some of the softer rural development that will take place in adjacent to infrastructure development. Right, and the agri-processing side. If you start to look at your social infrastructure, we've got uh, health, and I see we've got a health session after this one, uh, your school board programs and your higher indication uh, infrastructure. By the way, some of your people in the built environment was uh, responsible as SIP 14, uh, uh, SIP coordinator. And we will get to a question at a later stage around that. The whole. Knowledge SIPs, this is now broadband um, that we needed to narrow. And I think some of the questions also in the earlier uh, session dealt a little bit with by a city getting into the broadband role outside. Uh, and then also uh, where we are starting to look at how do we actually connect schools. And I think um, the Morocco Institute here uh, has done quite a lot of good work. But you can only get so far to help people to get to a policy framework. The next thing was the interesting part that we found in rolling out uh, that SIP was that that last mile connection was a problem or secondly, the access to data. So you sit with infrastructure rolled out, but people cannot use it, so it's not connected. Uh, SKA and Meerkat, that is happening, and it's run by DST and the SKA team. Regional SIPs, from a regional SIP point of view, we have water, we have got road, we've got electricity, and uh, so this is one of the programs that's a little bit more problematic to get going because there we, uh, the cooperation with your neighboring countries is one of the biggest challenges and to get to a great scope of work. Water and sanitation, I think, is one of the game changer uh, uh, SIPs that has been put together, but it's very difficult, however. In this country, we do not have a macro water and sanitation plan from your water resource development through to getting to the municipalities. Uh, and uh, this has been one of the key elements that will give us a problem in service delivery going forward. So that's still a work in progress. If I just quickly go to the built environment and I've looked at all the capabilities that's been allocated to this area of the CSIR structure, and I was interested to hear the question about organizational design. So we'll touch a little bit on that. But if you start to look at building science and technology, we have highly summarized construction materials and methods, agricultural in architectural engineering, and the construction industry and innovation. There's fair and square, quite a lot of overlap with the skills that you have there and what's happening in the infrastructure space. If you look at the spatial planning and systems, we've talked about it earlier on. If you look at the link that it has to SIP7, uh, around spatial planning. How do you develop smart cities? How do you actually also develop in SIP 14 your uh, university towns differently where you could share some critical infrastructure? Nearly done. Hydraulic infrastructure, we've dealt a lot with, with water and water san sanitation man management. Transport systems, there's quite a strong link around what we're doing in rail and water. Uh, uh, sorry, rail and uh, road. And then we also have your uh, pavement design. I think you're doing quite a lot of work also with Sunroll around the work on the maintenance of roads. Question is how do we take it to our provincial and uh, local government structures? And I think lastly, the innovative building technology side. If I look at the research impact areas, and I'm not going to spend too much time there, you've selected certain areas that you actually want to put into your corporate plan and what you want to focus your activities on going into the future. Question is, is it enough? Is it correctly focused with the products that you want to achieve and roll out in those areas? If I look to the link to infrastructure, and I think we've already dealt with it mainly, but I do think, uh, there's quite a big overlap of what is happening in the infrastructure development space and your capability side. 
if I look at the cross-cutting work, uh, work uh, this is the ones that I do think that we actually also have quite a lot of capability. The question is, how do we look at maintenance? Do we start to get involved in execution, or do we Chris, write the manual, and then nobody reads the manual on how to do that? Uh, the remarks from the MTF site was, I think the one point that I want to bring across here, is the fact that we do not get as much delivered from the amount of money that you spend from a government site. And some of the remarks was here, if you start to have a look at the cost of houses, your RDP houses, if you start to look at it, you can build a mansion if you build it in the city, actually, around that. So how do we start to look at the cost and what you get for your money that is available? Uh, public transport, uh, this links very much back to the, logis the, the spatial planning aspects and how do you put in smart solutions. Uh, I want to go back here. We had a question earlier on, is how do we play the game as a team? And there's two teams. It's a CSRR team with its different divisions. And then there's also government as a team because you are actually quite a trusted partner of government around this. So let's start to have a look at it. Implementation of infrastructure. What role do you need to play there? Do you need to start to get involved in actually implementing infrastructure projects? Is that your core focus and your mandate? I know there's some pressure around this, but the question is, is that where you put your skills to the best use? Research priorities. What about future needs? Because a lot of your income comes through research uh, contract income, which I understand are sometimes very short-term contracts. On the other hand, uh, you get mandated by your government departments or some of your state-owned entities. I have a question. Is this research that you get mandated to do really going to change the space in the industrial side or being ready for a new game-changer environment that we need to be in place? Because I think that's a core, core role that the CSIR need to play. Perception of being expensive. Um, I personally sat on the site where we wanted to bring innovative building technology programs through the PICC and the work that needed to be done. And uh, there was a big question around the perception of being expensive. And the question was, uh, do you have the right balance between your technical people and your administrative and other support structures? So it's maybe something to think about, because if you want to do more work in the space, it's something that you need to see is how you're actually going to deal with it. Fragmented repository of knowledge and intelligence. Long, long sentence, but I can work on a basis of personal experience that we, a lot of the time, specifically on GA, I, I will use GIS information as an uh, example we sometimes need to reinvent the wheel of work that's already been done for government in some or another area, whether you've done it for the, uh, the, the Department of uh, Evaluation and Monitoring or whether you've done it for schools, uh, for basic education. So the question is how can you manage infrastructure and spatial information in such a way that government can come back? They've already paid for it. But they don't have a central person that can say, wow, we've done that work before, so we have that information available. So I think there's something to think about how to partner with government. Um, and linked to that is also when I'm aware of the fact, or I've seen it happen, that sometimes you get to some government departments and they've got the research and development budget which they haven't spent, and they're going to be in the performance review process, either use it or lose it, or not going to get, the, uh, not, not spend it at all. How do we actually start to look from your knowledge base to be able to guide government on how to actually uh, direct research and development? And secondly, how do we make sure that two government departments or state-owned entities don't duplicate? And then lastly, norms and standards. Uh, you've been very good in writing big books of how to do things. 
and what is the minimum requirements. If you go on the ground in government departments or other entities, they have the book. The book is there. They can provide it. But how to implement it uh, and actually make it function appropriately is problematic. So maybe the way you structure contracts in the future needs to be looked at. Because uh, going back, you will find that some of your, your recommendations or the work that you've done on how to do has never been implemented. And I'm done. Thank you, Chair.